All right, thank you. Well, I'm David. I'm a senior data architect at Crunchy Data Solutions. Um, I've been actively developing with Postgres since 1999, which is a pretty long time. Um, although for most of that time, I, was, I spent more time actually working with Postgres. I've only really gotten into the community work uh, a couple of years ago. Um, all right, so I'm gonna compress this agenda a little bit because I have a little less time today than I, I normally have. Um, and usually I'm speaking to a, a very much more database-centric audience. So I'm gonna skip through um, some of the database, or, or, well, some of the details and try to get to what I think would be the important stuff for people attending this conference. Um, really quickly, let's just go through why backup. Um, I think most people know this. Everything on this list is pretty obvious. Uh, hmm. There it is. <laughs> uh, so we've got, you know, first one, of course, is always hard rail failure. Um, you know, no amount of redundancy can prevent things from, you know, a single machine from failing. You can have extra power supplies and extra drives and stuff like that. But things can still go wrong and completely go down. Um, backups are good for replication. They can help you bring up replicas. Uh, they can help you keep replicas up to date if you're not doing um, uh, uh, streaming from the server. Uh, corruption. Uh, so if, you, if your database experiences some corruption, you can use the backup to recover from that corruption. Depending on the type of corruption, your replica may have actually replicated it. Um, you know, especially if it's human corruption, as we see here in accidents. So if someone drops a table, the replica will mirror that pretty quickly unless there's a replication delay. Even if there is a replication delay, you're on the clock. You, know, you need to make sure you get there before something actually drops and, and is gone. Uh, so if that happens, um, your backups are your best source to go back and pull that data out and get it back into production in some way. Uh, some more, some practical things, development. So if you're in a situation where you can actually use your data, you know, the data in your production system and bring that directly into development, you can use your backups for that. Um, reporting. So you can set up a, maybe you don't want to report off of your standbys because in Postgres at least you can't write on a standby. So sometimes for reporting you want to create temp tables or do other things like that. So you can have a disconnected reporting server that you actually restore from a backup every morning, do your reporting run, and, uh, and you're good to go. Uh, and then forensics is, this is for important data that you actually removed on purpose, but later are interested in for some reason. Um, just trying to figure out who changed something, why it was changed, uh, how many widgets that customer had bought way back when, something like that. So uh, forensics is another important reason. Um, in order for this to be useful, it probably means you need to have a long history of backups, which may or may not be practical based on the size of your database. All right, Schrodinger's backup. This is very important. The state of any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. Uh, I've been trying to track down who said this, um, I have, there, there are some competing sources. I haven't quite figured it out yet, but, uh, but it's true. Um, and, and because of this, I have this concept called a living backup, all right? So most companies, what they'll do is they'll, you know, put some kind of backup policy in place. They'll write a document. Maybe they'll have the occasional backup drill where they go and try to restore or something. Uh, this almost never works. The document gets out of date. Uh, the six-month drill is postponed because you're busy, people are busy, there's a release going on. So what you need to do in order to have backups that work and a backup system that works is to, and the two are related, of course, is to find a way to integrate backups into your enterprise, all right? So we talked about development. Um, so using them to, you know, for syncing your replicas or building new replicas. Um, especially if you have asynchronous replicas that are actually re, re, you know, pulling wall log from the primary backups. Uh, offline reporting we just talked about. Uh, offline data archiving is another one. So let's say you have maybe regulatory requirements or something else, so you need to dump out a month of data and you do that after two years or whatever. You can actually do that dump from a replica or from an offline data source and then go and truncate production when you're done to reduce load on production. Um, and then, of course, the last one I said was development. Uh, so one of these, you really should find one of these ways to get the backups in, because basically, if you've got code paths that aren't being used, they probably don't work. Uh, you, they might work, but it's not a certainty. And, and the other thing is that if you, 
if you're using restores on a regular basis and, and people know how that works and they're comfortable with it, it'll make a, a primary database failure a lot less scary. Because normally if you get that primary database failure, then you have to go to this old document to get your restore procedures and it's frightening, no one knows how to do it. Uh, your, your risk of doing something wrong is greatly increased in that situation. However, if people have coded this stuff, they're using it on a daily basis or weekly basis, when you actually have a problem on your primary or one, you know, one of your main databases, people will know what they're doing. They'll feel comfortable with the process. Um, this is actually one of the slides I'm gonna skip over quite a bit. Um, basically, there are quite a number of ways to do backup in Postgres. It's the subject of this talk, of course. Um, these first ones, uh, PG dump and PG base backup, one is a logical backup and one is a binary backup. Uh, they're good, but the problem is, is they only capture a moment in time. So let's say you do your backup at 12.05 a.m. and you have a failure at 11.30 p.m. Well, you've lost almost a day of data. You can restore that backup, um, but then you're kind of stuck with an entire day of data loss. Uh, these solutions down here, manual and third party, attempt to uh, make that better by not only taking a backup, but actually preserving all the archive that's produced in the intervening time. So the database is actually creating these what are called wall segments in, in Postgres that have a record of everything that's happened on the database. So everything is written there first, and then it's written out to the heap. So if you have a backup and then the entire wall stream from when the backup was taken, you can actually recover to any point in time within that time. So if your system fails at 11.30 p.m., you're current up until the last wall segment that was um, sent from the server, and you can actually set that to be very conservative, or you could also look at your streaming replica. If it's a hardware failure, streaming replica is probably good enough, right? That's what it's for, it's a failover. Uh, if something else happens, then it may not be good because the corruption may have spread there. Um, and then of course the last thing uh, that you can use is, is backrest, which works a lot like these guys down here, uh, just with a lot more advanced features. So let's talk about design for a minute. So the, the, the primary idea behind backrest is pretty much every piece of backup software out there, at least in the backrest space, is based on tar or rsync, uh, a lot of command line tools, things like that. And rsync is a great, rsync is fantastic, don't get me wrong, I don't wanna bash rsync here. Uh, and, and so good that most backup solutions are based on it, because it's just so easy to use. But it has some real limitations when it comes to scaling. Uh, the first one is that it's single threaded. This is huge. So unless you actually write software to break up the job, rsync is just gonna chug through in a single threaded way. And these days, I mean, there's so many, you know, machines have so many cores. The cores aren't getting that much faster, but you're getting more and more of them. So compression is a big problem for you. Well, actually, of course, and one of the problems with rsync is it doesn't do destination compression. So it'll do compression in transit, but once it gets to the destination, it's gonna uncompress it and you're left with uncompressed data at rest, which is a bad thing. You really don't want that. Um, another thing is this one second timestamp resolution. I don't wanna go deeply into this, but basically if you are trying to use rsync for incrementals, there's a danger that you'll actually miss files that Postgres has modified. And the reason is if rsync starts, uh, builds its manifest and Postgres modifies that file in the same second, which is not an outlandish uh, scenario, believe me, then the next time you go to do an rsync, rsync will think that file has not changed. And the only way to prevent this is to use checksums, uh, which is really expensive for, say, data warehousing applications, things like that, it's, it's just too much. Um, another problem with rsync is if you do incrementals and you decide to trust them, which I wouldn't unless you're doing checksums, uh, if you wanna do incrementals, the previous backup has to be uncompressed. So even if you're rsyncing and then compressing, you have to have at least two uncompressed backups. You have to have full backup uncompressed and the incremental. If you're doing incremental, you know, stringing them together, then all of those need to be uncompressed. It's, uh, it's a significant limitation. So Backrest basically, to avoid that, implements its own protocol. Um, the very first version, the first version that went to production, which was actually point one, believe it or not, uh, faked this by using a bunch of command line tools with pipes um, to prove that the concept worked. Uh, and then the next version actually uh, implemented a complete protocol layer to do everything within native Perl. Um, 
and it also solves the timestamp resolution issue. It turns out this is actually really simple. All you have to do is, once you've built the manifest, wait the remainder of the current second, and then start copying. If Postgres modifies files, they'll get a new timestamp. Now, that may not happen until the next fsync, but you know that the next backup, you know, between, you don't, not really worried about the timestamps for the current run, because they've already been read. What you're worried about is the next time you do a, a backup, and you know an fsync will happen before the backup and those timestamps will be written. Most OSs will write those timestamps out way before that, but it's not guaranteed, uh, in POSIX at least. All right, so real quick, let's go through some of the features. So um, uh, compression and checksums are done in stream and size calculation. So nothing is done at rest. So everything is done while the file is being moved, you know, copied from one place to another. Uh, there's asynchronous compression and transfer for walls. So you can actually just have Postgres offload the wall, and an asynchronous process will pick those up, compress them, and send them on. A Little bit of multiprocessing there. Um, the other interesting thing here is that you can actually set a limit for the amount of wall that you'll store locally. So if something happens to the backup server, uh, you can actually tell Postgres to, well, essentially what will happen is you'll start dropping wall, um, which will mean that you can't do point in time recovery from your last backup, but the primary server stays up. Uh, in Postgres, if the primary, if the wall directory actually fills up, PGX log fills up, then the uh, system panics. That's it. Database is down. Uh, you could do remote or local operation really trivially, so you can write to a local disk and have backup software come along and pick it up. Uh, NFS mount, um, you know, you can write uh, remotely over SSH to another server. Um, it really depends on the size of your enterprise. So the whole idea of backrest is that it starts simple and then scales massively. Uh, this is probably the most important thing, uh, threading for parallel compression and transfer. So you wanna take advantage of those cores. Now when you're actually doing backups, you may not wanna use a lot of cores. Uh, most people use between two and eight, depending. Um, but you know, this is also running on an active database server, so you don't want to use all of your CPU re resources. Now when you're restoring, you can use parallel restore, and when you're doing a restore, by definition, the database is shut down. So you can go ahead and feel free to use all the resources. Um, and it could, restores can be extremely fast on account of that. Uh, there's full differential incremental, uh, full differential and incremental support. So you can create all kinds of interesting backup plans. Uh, backup, there are um, expiration policies for backup and archive. Those two things are tied together, so if a backup expires, Archive that's older than that will also be expired. Uh, backups are resumable. So if you've got that 10 terabyte backup that you're in the middle of and something goes wrong or it dies, you can actually resume it again. Uh, it'll, it will have to check some. Everything is currently sitting you know, in the temp directory, but that's all load on the backup server and not on the database server. And as soon as it gets to the point where it's happy with everything that's there based on what it had in its manifest, it will start backing up from the database server again. Um, there's also hard linking, uh, which is an interesting use case. If you're using ZFS, you can actually store backups uncompressed on ZFS uh, and take a snapshot. And then the backup directory is, actually looks like a consistent Postgres cluster to Postgres. So you can basically, from that snapshot, you can start up Postgres off of the snapshot, which is really valuable for super large databases. You want to go get some information or you want to dump some data for development. Um, but you know, copying a 10 terabyte database anywhere is miserable, so you don't have to do that. You can bring it up in place on the database server. It'll still have to do recovery, so it'll need access to the wall archive, but other than that, it could be extremely efficient. Uh, and it works with Postgres greater than or equal 9.3. Um, I know that people are thinking like, hey, everything below 9.1 is end of life. Well, that's great, but the fact is, there are actually a lot of people out there running 8.4. Um, I haven't seen 8.3 in a while, but there are a lot of people running 8.4, and you know, you need to back up. Um, I'm gonna skip over this a little bit. This is what I was just talking about, that the actual backup structure looks like a consistent Postgres cluster. I actually rewrite the table space links even and do everything. Now, if it's gzipped, that's a problem. Um, Postgres won't like that very much, but you can ungzip it, or as I said, you can use uh, file system compression to make it trans the compression transparent. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, so let's talk about performance a little bit. So here's the, uh, I don't wanna fall off this thing. 
So here's a comparison between backrest and rsync when th there's no destination compression. So they're both gonna be doing protocol level compression, but storing uncompressed on the destination side. And what we can see is rsync is a bit faster. Um, rsync is written in C, it's been optimized a lot. Uh, the protocol I wrote is fairly new. Um, you know, parts of it are written Perl and parts of it, you know, the compression is still in C. Uh, but the rest, all the kind of uh, buffer manipulation is done in Perl. So that's a little bit slower. Um, now let's take the case where we, um, we go to two threads. Well now, suddenly you can see a pretty big improvement. Uh, but we see an even bigger improvement when we say we want destination compression, which face it is what most people want. So what Backrest will do is compress on the source side, which is the database, um, and then when it gets to the destination, all it has to do is store it. That's it, because it's already compressed. Um, this is why we're using L6 compression here instead of L3. If, you're only do, if, you're, if your destination is uncompressed, Backrest will automatically use level three gzip compression, because it's pretty good and it's really fast. Uh, if you're gonna store the files, it'll automatically select level six compression, and of course you can control that. Uh, and now we can see that you know, as we go to two threads, we basically scale 2x. Um, and this actually, I mean, there is, there is threading and queues and messaging and some other things going on, so it doesn't perfectly scale up as it goes, but it, it's quite, quite linear in terms of its growth. At least up to eight threads, which is the most we've really tested extensively in the field. Love this slide, I don't know why. <laughs> All right, so demo. I actually went a little quicker than expected, but we'll, uh, Spend a little more time on the demo. Maybe. Hmm. There we go. All right, I kind of, I actually started up the demo a minute ago because I wanted to um, make sure that things looked right on this screen. Uh, but you can see up here I ran it. Now, I did just run this a few minutes ago. So, so this is a, a live demo. So every, all the commands you see here are actually gonna be run real time, but it's scripted, because I can't type in front of an audience. So, and also this way I get to get a lot more done. So this first screen is basically just set up. Uh, we're gonna stop the old cluster if there was one, create a database directory, uh, create a new Postgres cluster. So this one command creates this new Postgres database, which is pretty cool. Uh, it makes it very easy to do um, you know, small scale testing like this. And the next thing we're gonna do is start the cluster uh, with archive mode on, uh, wall level will be archive, since we're not gonna have a hot standby in this example. Uh, here's the archive man, uh, command, pg backrest stands equals main archive push. And then percent %p is where Postgres will put the actual archive file that's going to be pushed. Uh, and then we start up. Now we're also gonna create a test table, which we're gonna use to store messages during the demo to, as we do backups and restores, we'll wanna see that what we're doing actu is actually working and that's where we'll store some basic messaging information to keep track. Uh, and then here's our very basic um, backrest.conf. Uh, we need a repository path, so that's where the backups and archive are gonna go. Uh, and then we need the database path. Now, people who are expert in Postgres always ask me, why can't you just ask the database for the database path? Well, that's great when the database is running, but in a restore situation, the database won't be running. So what Backrest does is it requires you to set this variable, but when you do a backup, it'll actually compare it with what the database thinks, you know, where it thinks it is. And if those two things don't match, it will actually fail. So you'll know this is not configured correctly when you do your first backup, or every backup. Not when you're doing a restore, and the restore doesn't work because it's going to the wrong location and Postgres is unhappy. So just a little bit of safety here. Everything is geared towards making the restores as safe and efficient and easy and reliable as possible. All right, so let's do a full backup. Uh, Ta-da, so this is pretty easy, backrest. We'll talk about the stanza for a minute. This is basically just the configuration section. Um, the, the term is a little controversial, but this is used in Amanda and Bacula and some other places. So it just describes a set of configuration. Um, it may or may not be the actual cluster name uh, for instance, if you've got replicas, you might have a cluster that's main and the replica is called replica. Um, so it's more the, the group of uh, stuff. So you might call it app 
or DW or something like that, something a little more meaningful. Uh, so we started with a database size of 52 meg. Um, this is the actual backup directory. We can see we've got, gotten one full backup here. And latest is pointing at that full backup. There's this backup info file, which I usually delve into too, but there's a lot of detail there in there about what happened, but we're gonna skip that for now. We'll, we will see some stuff from that a little bit later. Uh, and here's our backup size, 5.2 meg. That's pretty good. Uh, don't get too excited though, because this database is completely empty, so there are a lot of zeros. Uh, you would not normally get the compression this good. 70% is more typical. Um, all right, and here's the archive directory. So we can see we've got a couple of uh, archive files that got kicked out here and one backup file. So this is, uh, we'll give information about the backup, uh, which archive file it started with, which archive file it ended with. Uh, in this case, there's just one, because we didn't actually change anything during the backup, but every backup will include at least one archive log. If you try to do, just make a copy of a database, you will not get a consistent copy. Uh, and if you just, even if you do start and stop backup and copy the files that way, Postgres will not start with it, without at least one archive log and, and usually more than that. Um, and our archive size is quite small. So archive logs are 16 meg a piece and these two only come up to 1.8 meg. That was pretty good. All right, so let's do a differential. Uh, so that was a lot quicker, obviously, because we're not copying as much. Um, our database is up to 68 meg now. This is because of, we didn't actually add that much data to the database, but we've added extra archive logs. So Postgres keeps them for a while before it recycles them, and they can actually use a lot more space than your database, depending on your application. Uh, and now we've got this differential, which we can see is based off of the full backup, and latest has been moved to the differential. Um, now our backup size has not really increased a whole lot because the differential is only copying what changed. Since we didn't actually do anything to the database, really it's just PG control and a couple of other things that, that are always changing in the database. Uh, yeah, so here's archive again. So we can see we picked up a new couple of new uh, archive files and a new backup file. And our archive size hasn't really changed a whole lot since we haven't been changing much. All right, so let's do something a little more exciting here. So let's say it's time for a release. Uh, we're gonna do, you know, database code and app code are gonna go out with this release. So one thing that's good to do, if you can, is to take a backup right before the release. It doesn't have to be in the release window. It could be maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, you don't have to do it. It really depends on how much wall your database generates. If your database has low volume, then you can use the backup from that morning. If something goes wrong, and it will, in this demo, of course. Uh, you can use the backup from the morning and replay the wall for the entire day. Um, but I have had databases that generate 500 gig of wall a day, and replaying that is not a whole lot of fun. So if you can do an incremental here, that's a good idea. All right, so the other thing it's good to do before release is uh, create a restore point. So this gives Postgres an exact moment in time that you'd like to restore to. So at this point, we've shut down the application. There are no more writes going to the database. We may have shut down the ETL, whatever. Uh, now, you don't have to do that. Of course, Postgres will give you a consistent restore point, but any transactions that were in progress during that restore point will be lost if you restore. Only complete transactions will be applied. So, but in this case, everything's shut down. We're gonna create a restore point, uh, and then we're going to, oh, well this is, sorry, we're inserting this into our test table before release and then we create a restore point. And Postgres will very nicely tell us where that restore point was created, although, honestly, this doesn't mean much to most people. It's just a uh, uh, location in the wall log. All right, so now we perform the release, uh, and we're going to update the test message to say after release. So now we've got a test message before release, a restore point, and a test message after the release. Uh, okay, so the release goes on and, and database release is successful, but something's wrong with the application, they can't get something working, they decide they wanna roll back. So there's really two ways to, uh, in database releases to roll back. One, of course, is to write rollback scripts, which are notoriously unreliable, usually not very well tested. Uh, so, but another way to do it is just to say, well, forget the whole rollback script thing. Let's accept the fact that, um, you know, having to roll back from releases is a bit of a rarity, 
we'll just go ahead and do a um, recovery instead. So okay, cool. So we decide we're gonna do a recovery of stanza main. Uh, this is the type of the recovery by name, and here's our target release. So that was that restore point that we set earlier on. Uh, we're gonna use this dash dash delta option and then restore. Uh, delta basically says that the uh, database directories do not have to be empty. By default, Backrest will expect the database directories to have been cleared out manually. Um, Delta says, okay, well, I'll just go ahead and I'll check some everything in the folder and only pull the stuff from the backup archive that I actually need. Uh, in the case of multi-threading, this can be extremely efficient, very, very fast. Uh, but we got an error. This is unable to restore while Postgres is running. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> Backrest does everything it can to keep you from doing something stupid. Um, it's detected that Postgres is running on this cluster and it's not gonna allow you to do a restore. The database has to be shut down. You can't do a restore on a live database. So let's stop the database and try it again. So here we stop the DB, we run the same command, um, and then just show you here, the Postgres requires a recovery.com file to tell it you know, where to recover to if you're going to recover to a point in time. And Backrest actually writes that for you, which is pretty handy. Um, now we're gonna restart the cluster. That's here, same command we used before. Uh, and select message from test. Ta-da, before release. So we got back to where we were right before that restore point. And the day is saved, right? Yay. Uh, and with, with, with parallel delta restore, it's extraordinarily fast. So even if you had a long update and you've changed a lot of stuff, you would want to use Delta Restore rather than try to run a rollback script. I guarantee you'll be faster based on your you know, amount of data change. This is more efficient and it's safer and it's easier and you don't have to prepare it in advance. Uh, another interesting thing has happened is, okay, so show of hands, anyone familiar with timelines? Okay, anyone seen Star Trek? All right, anyone familiar with timelines in Star Trek? All right, so you know how it goes, something happens and then they split off into an alternate dimension and everything goes different. Well, the same thing has just happened here in Postgres. All right, so we, because we restored to a point in time which was not the end of the wall stream, it created a new timeline for us. So now we've got timeline one, which was what originally happened where we did the release, and now we've got timeline two where we forked off right before the release, all right? They're both equally valid, and we can actually use both of them. Not at the same time, of course, because that would be bad. So, let's take a look at how that works. All right, so, after we did the rollback, they brought the application back up. And some very important data got written into the database, right? So this is important to remember. Or maybe they didn't realize they had started the application and some important data got written into the database. In any case, uh, at some point, QA says they made a mistake, the release was fine. Can we go back to what we had done before? Now think of a case where a database release maybe takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. Well, we say, hey, we're gonna use this cool point in time recovery thing to just go ahead and replay back on a timeline one. So we do that. Uh, timelines can be a little confusing because in this case, because the backup that I'm going to restore from, the last book backup we took was on timeline one, Postgres will follow timeline one when it restores, right? So I don't actually have to specify anything special, I just tell it to do a restore, and it'll go back to the last backup, replay timeline one, and that brings us back to our message after release, which was what we did you know, after the release was actually done. So cool, so now we're back after the release, everyone's happy, right? Well, not exactly. So remember that, so there was that important update and now it's gone. Because it wasn't on timeline one, the important update was on timeline two. <sighs> All right, so now we wanna go get that data. Now this is a case of what I was saying, a kind of like forensics thing where you can go back to, depending on what the data was, I mean one way you might do this is you might say, okay, well I'm gonna restore back to timeline two then reapply the database update on top of that. That would be one valid thing to do. Or you could say, well, it was really only one row, so what I'm gonna do is on my backup server or on some other server, I'm gonna restore timeline two right here, 
I'll get that one piece of data out and I'll go manually insert in the database or I'll do a PG dump and restore or something like that. There's a couple different techniques you could do here, but it's not a one size fits all kind of thing. The important thing from the perspective of backrest is you can get that data. So we do our uh, restore along timeline two and you can see the recovery file indicates that and voila, we've come back to our very important update and we have the data that, that we need. So, timelines, does that make sense to everyone or is that kind of still a little scary? Okay, I, I can tell you there are a lot of DBAs who make it through their lives without ever dealing with timelines or thinking about them. So, this is, was a really contrived example to show you, you know, the power of point in time recovery and of timelines, but people don't really have to deal with them that much, which actually from my perspective is kind of scary because the more you deal with something, the more comfortable you become with it. Um, and I'm only so comfortable with timelines because I wrote tons of regression tests to make sure all the stuff worked. Uh, so there's some other stuff you can do. Um, obviously backup restore is important, archiving. Those are the primary features of backrest, but getting information is also really important. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can get information. There's a really basic uh, textual information you can get that just give you your most recent and your oldest backup, give you the status of this particular stanza. Um, the other thing you can do is, and now I'm gonna have to scroll. Uh, the other kind of information you can get is in JSON form. So if you specify uh, output equals JSON, then it will basically give you the kitchen sink. Um, remember that backup info file I was telling you about that had tons of interesting information about the history of your backups? You know, which backups are currently in there and how big they were? Well, it's all here. So you can see um, you know, the start and stop archive, the you know, backrest information, database information, uh, the size of the you know, bunch of size info, um, the actual backup label, what, you know, what it references, priors, timestamps, et cetera, et cetera. So this can all be you know, parsed and fed into any monitoring system you want. See, are your backups being uh, created in a timely fashion? Uh, what's your rate of growth? You know, things like that. I think that, well, I Finished a little bit early. Okay, so uh, so anyway, that's all I've got. Um, here's the website. So uh, I think there's um, the user guide on the website is a little interesting because it's it's written using a new doc system I've been developing uh, that actually goes through, you know basically runs documentations as a, a documentation as a regression test. So as it builds the docs, it actually runs all of the commands in the documentation, captures output, you know uses regular expressions to search for certain things. So if anything changes in the program, the docs will fail to build and you, you have to rerun. So you can have a lot of confidence that the user guide, all those commands in the user guide actually work in sequence because every time I build the docs, they get run. Um, you can contact me here or at Crunchy Data. That's where I work. So if you have uh, backup needs, obviously we do all that kind of stuff. Uh, the release page is here on GitHub and also um, this link has all of my uh, conference slides so if you go there, you'll find the slides and the demo uh, for this talk. All right, great, so any questions? No, okay, sure. Currently they are, it, it is not. Um, we, I'm talking to some people about getting it packaged and getting into postgres.org. Uh, the user guide actually does have instructions for installing it. It's a Perl program, so it's actually quite simple. And what I did was make sure that I'm not using anything exotic. So all the uh, modules that are used are uh, directly available as packages on CentOS and you know, Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat. So those four systems at least. Um, so there's no need to install CPAN or bring in CPAN modules or do anything crazy like that. It's all very basic and very easy to install. As I said, most of it's really custom. So it doesn't use a lot of libraries. The most important ones are the SHA-1 library and the, um, uh, and the, you know, the compression library. Well, all right, are, yeah. yeah, if there are no more questions, uh, please join me in thanking our speaker. Yeah. Right, thanks.